Corporate funding for Nova Science Now is provided by the following. Foundation funding is provided by. Welcome back. A breaking story tonight. Big storm brewing. We've got a meteorologist in the field. Can you hear me? Yes. As you can see, I'm in the thick of it out here. Excuse me, but where are you? I'm out in space, orbiting Earth. And believe it or not, there's some serious storms up here. And they can cause all kinds of problems down there, especially with communication systems. We seem to be having some technical difficulties. And in the meantime, check this out. Anyone who has seen the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, will tell you that one of nature's most spectacular performances. A celestial ballet of light dancing across the night sky. But it turns out there's much more to this dazzling display than meets the eye because the same thing that powers the dance of the Northern Lights can also wreak havoc, exposing astronauts to deadly amounts of radiation, frying electrical systems and satellites, and overwhelming power grids causing widespread blackouts. Problem is, no one has ever been able to agree on the exact choreography of events that gives rise to both this beauty and danger. This has been one of the persistent and difficult questions to solve in space physics. But now, an unusual space mission is aiming to solve this mystery once and for all. Because figuring out what makes the Northern Lights dance may also hold the key to predicting these kinds of events and avoiding disaster. The Northern Lights take place more than 60 miles above Earth's surface. But they're not caused by weather on Earth. They're caused by something much less familiar, called space weather. Now, some of you may be thinking, space weather? Can't possibly rain or snow in space. I mean, you don't see astronauts shoveling out the space station, do you? Well, turns out space has its own special kind of weather, thanks to that big ball of glowing gas we call the sun. Every day, the sun spews out a million tons of electrically charged particles, which race away at up to 300 miles per second, forming what's known as the solar wind. Most of these particles are deflected by Earth's magnetic field, the protective shield that envelops our planet. But some sneak through and eventually collide with air molecules. When they hit oxygen, you get a red or a green glow. Nitrogen, a blue glow, creating a steady ring of lights around the north and south magnetic poles. But sometimes, the whole process goes berserk. Huge amounts of energy from the solar wind build up in Earth's magnetic field and then are released in a sudden explosion called a substorm. And you can tell when that happens because the northern lights start to dance. So the eruption of the aurora really corresponds to an eruption of a substorm, an energy release out in space. But where do these violent storms begin? To find out, a team has launched a mission called Themis, consisting of five identical satellites. Wait a minute, five satellites? Isn't that overkill? Well, to see why they needed that many, think of a tsunami. A single buoy in the ocean can tell you if a tsunami has taken place. But if you want to figure out which way the wave is moving and how fast, you need multiple buoys. And it's the same with substorms, except instead of buoys in the ocean, the Themis mission is using satellites. The goal of the mission is to figure out exactly where substorms start. And once every four days, the satellites enter the region of space where substorms occur to detect if they erupt near Earth or farther out in the magnetic field. The Themis mission is operated at the University of California at Berkeley. 
What am I looking at? Now you can see... Uh, I see the Earth in the middle. That's right, and the, uh, the five satellite orbits uh, off to the right. This covers four days' worth of orbit tracks. And it's very clear when they all line up. Exactly. Themis is named for the Greek goddess of justice, that blindfolded lady that holds the scales on courthouses. And just as the goddess weighed competing explanations to determine the truth, the Themis mission will try to discover the truth about substorms. The evidence will be gathered by huge antennas on each satellite. And to see how they packed five of these into just one rocket, I paid a visit to one of the guys who designed them. So where have you brought me? What is this place? Well, so this is the mechanical engineering lab. That one was antenna was designed like a kind of high-tech jack-in-the-box. It was nicknamed uh, the Death Spike for reasons that would soon become obvious. And when I pull this string, it's going to release. Can I give you a countdown? Yes, go ahead. OK, ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Whoa. <laughs> so as you can see, about 10 foot up. And with these antennas deployed, the team hopes the satellites will be in the right place at the right time to catch a substorm in action. It's like we've laid this trap. We've gone to the jungle and we're waiting for the tiger. And missions like Themis come not a moment too soon. The sun works on an 11-year cycle its activity level rising and falling with the number of magnetic disturbances called sunspots visible on the surface. Over the years, people have tried to link the sunspot cycle to everything from skirt lengths to stock prices. But one thing we know it does relate to is space weather. And right now we're entering a new solar cycle which will peak between 2011 and 2012. When that happens, the first to know about it will be the nation's Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, Colorado. Here, a special breed of weathermen keep their eyes on the sun 24-7. Solar terrestrial indices for 20... Drawing on observations, data from satellites, experience, and a strong dose of intuition, they issue alerts and warnings, as well as a daily space weather forecast. No space weather storms are expected for the next 24 hours. So who needs a space weather forecast? Well, NASA for one. And everyone from utility companies to satellite operators would like even longer range forecasts, like we have for weather on Earth. But that's a tall order. Space weather is much more difficult to predict than terrestrial weather. First of all, the volume of space between us and the sun is 93 million miles cubed in size. It's huge. To get a handle on such an enormous volume, space physicists just up the road from the Prediction Center are trying to build computer models to forecast space weather. The results look like this. A simulation predicting how hard the solar wind's blowing, the direction of the magnetic field, and the appearance of the northern lights. But today, these models can only make forecasts about an hour in advance. We are, in essence, back at where weather forecasting was in the 1950s. We're just kind of getting started into this system and making progress. But it's a kind of exciting time to be in this because you're at the beginning of a, of a new capability and providing these tools. Meanwhile, to gather information to improve these tools, the Themis satellites continue lining up every four days in Earth's magnetic field, lying in wait for substorms. It'd be fun to be on one of these satellites as you sort of come into alignment. And watch one of these uh, auroras break up at the same no, time. I, no, I don't want to be there for that. <laughs> <laughs> it takes two days for all the data from the outermost satellite to download to Earth. And it will take months or even years to analyze. But in previous alignments, the team's already been lucky, snaring several substorms. This is when the three substorms took place. One took place here, the next one about an hour later, and the next one about yet another hour later. So it's these peaks. These peaks. Within That's the, the bleeding of edge of the frontier of science. That is exactly right. And if their luck holds, they'll catch enough substorms in this two-year mission to figure out the physics needed to improve space weather prediction and to solve the mystery of what makes the aurora dance. <laughs> <laughs>